Hello, and welcome to Tales of the Household Cavalry, the first in a new series of Household Cavalry Museum video podcasts that will continue until the museum reopens and I can once again access the museum's collection. In this first video, I'm going to highlight the many and varied roles that have been adopted by our regiments since their formation before and shortly after the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. I'm sure that if asked, most viewers would say that the lifeguards and the Blues and Royals and their predecessor regiments fought as horsed cavalry until the Second World War when they were mechanized, and that since the war they've served on tanks and armored cars whilst maintaining a mounted ceremonial unit in London. This is far from being the truth, as we will see. Now, whilst it's true that the original lifeguards were formed as a mounted bodyguard for the exiled King Charles II, the Blues were raised as Cromwellian cavalry, and the Royals were established to defend Tangier, from the earliest days, household cavalrymen were required to be flexible when it came to work. In 1665, the future King James II was the Lord High Admiral in command of the British fleet at the Battle of Lowestoft, fought against the Dutch. Like the King, James had his own troop of horse guards. Captain of that troop was the Earl of Falmouth, who, along with several other officers, felt duty bound as the Duke's bodyguard to be with him at sea aboard the flagship, the Royal Charles. Unfortunately, it did not end well for them. When a single cannonball from the Dutch flagship killed the Earl, along with two other horse guards, Lord Muskerry and Mr. Richard Boyle. Not content with serving as Marines, during the Great Fire of London, officers and men from the King's troop of horse guards acted as firemen under the King's direction, as shown here on the left, who tasked them with blowing up houses to create fire breaks. Then, in 1678, all the troops of horse guards were required to raise horse grenadier troops, which were mounted infantry armed with muskets and grenades, shown here in their 1750 uniform. So, by the time the troops of horse and horse grenadier guards were formed into the first and second lifeguards in 1788, household cavalrymen had acted as marines, firemen and infantry, as well as acting occasionally as policemen, excise officers and in counter-terrorism duties, all in addition to their traditional role as the Sovereign's mounted bodyguard and in their role in battle as heavy cavalry, as seen in this slide at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. In the 19th century, the requirement for the household cavalry to be flexible meant that lifeguards were involved in 1820 in the arrest of the Cato Street conspirators and guarding their subsequent execution, and in the suppression of rioters in Trafalgar Square on Bloody Sunday in 1887. The next new role for the regiments of the Household Cavalry arose in 1884 with the expedition to rescue General Gordon, shown here on the left in his uniform as Governor of Sudan, who was trapped in Khartoum by the Mahdi, shown on the right, and his army of Islamist insurgents. The relief expedition was led by Sir Garnet Woolsey, a future Colonel of the Blues, as you can see from the picture of him on the left who ordered the formation of a Camel Corps consisting of a heavy cavalry, a guards and a mounted infantry regiment as part of his desert column. The three regiments of the Household Cavalry contributed officers and men to the Heavy Camel Regiment. Although the expedition failed to reach Khartoum in time to save Gordon, the desert column fought a stiff action dismounted at the Abu Claire Wells during which Colonel Fred Burnaby of the Blues was killed after breaking open the square to rescue his friend Lord Charles Beresford. Meanwhile, life for our regiments returned to normality, at least in terms of soldiering, until the outbreak of the First World War. During which, 
In addition to their role as horsed cavalry, our regiments formed, clockwise from the top left, two cycle companies, an infantry battalion, three truck-borne machine gun regiments, and a tractor-drawn siege battery. More recently, our regiments have consistently contributed men to the Guards Parachute Company and the SAS, fought on donkeys in Cyprus in the 1950s, formed helicopter troops in the 1960s, served as infantry in Northern Ireland in the 1970s, formed parachute and air droppable units in the 1980s, and been mounted in a variety of vehicles, including Land Rovers, main battle tanks, and armoured cars. And the Household Cavalry Regiment is currently being re-equipped with the Army's latest Ajax family of armoured fighting vehicles. Not surprisingly, our recruiting slogan in the 1960s was Ride, Drive and Fly with the Household Cavalry. Next week, I'm going to take you behind the scenes of the Household Cavalry pageant held on Horse Guards Parade in 2008 to mark the opening by the Queen of the Household Cavalry Museum. I shall be revealing some previously undisclosed secrets. Until then, stay well and stay safe.